thanks for having me uh, yet again. So I have another presentation for you. Um, so this one is going to be focused on um, how to write comment letters on proposed SQL pro projects. And um, before I get into the detail, I just want to say that SQL is not rocket science for those of you who have been you know, involved in these cases and projects before. There is a lot of legal jargon, but you know, with a little bit of practice, a little bit of research, um, you can get the hang of it and you can write um, you know, strong and informative comments on these documents even if you're not you know, a lawyer or don't have formal training. So uh, here is a uh, roadmap. Um, first, I'm going to talk for a moment. Uh, you probably already know this, why commenting is important. Um, give some general tips on commenting, and then talk about is issue spotting for certain types of SQL violations. I'm going to focus on project description, piecemealing, baseline, project impacts, mitigation, deferred mitigation, um, some kind of fancy legal words. They don't, they're not that complicated, though, upon closer inspection. And then I'm going to talk a little about air quality and bioresource uh, commenting. And then finally, some more tips and thoughts about commenting in the SQL process. So why is commenting important? Um, this may be, in a sense, speaking to the choir a little bit. But um, commenting can sometimes, emphasis on sometimes, improve the project or lead the agency to adopt a less intensive project alternative or stronger mitigation measures. And that obviously is one of the, the ideas behind SQL, at least in theory, that the public will participate in the process and lead to better decision making. Whether that always happens in practice is obviously a different question. Um, and you know, we've talked about this a little bit already today. Um, the agency is required to adopt mitigation measures if there are significant impacts as a substantive requirement as opposed to NEPA, which is merely procedural. The other reason that commenting is important is this wonky term called exhaustion of administrative remedies. Um, it's basically just um, a legal way of saying, if you don't raise the issue before the agency, um, you can't raise it later in the lawsuit. So somebody has to raise that exact issue before the agency, comment on the EAR and say, hey, your analysis about the water quality section is deficient for these reasons. You can't say later to the court, you can't bring it up later unless you brought it up before the agency, before decision making. And that's why commenting can be so critical, um, because it, a lawyer can't take a case later unless the comment was raised before the agency. And then the last thing I have on here is that, um, you know, if an agency is initially saying, oh, this can be approved via a negative declaration, we don't have to do an EIR. If you submit comments showing that, hey, actually, this project is going to have a significant impact, then that might compel them to prepare an EIR and actually take a close look at the impacts of the project and propose mitigation. Um, so just a couple general tips before I get more into the weeds. Um, one of the best things you can do, a, a lot of like commenting on SQL documents is um, just an exercise in critical reading. Um, make the agency show its work, look for conclusory statements in the document. Um, I think in my last presentation I had an example of that with the Western Pond Turtle, where the agency will say, well, this piece of information, well, the, this species isn't here because of this, even though that piece of information doesn't support the conclusion. So um, look closely at what assumptions they're making in the document. Um, challenge them to show their evidence, show their analysis, show their studies. Um, identify inconsistencies. You'd be surprised how often the EIR will say um, A is true at one point and then later on say A is not true. Um, it will just contradict itself. So just keeping a close eye for stuff like that, which again, you don't need a law degree to do any of this. And then just obvious, um, just basic, um, you know, writing tips such as, you know, organize your comments based upon the section of the EIR so it's easy for them to respond to them. Um, say like, this is my comments on the air quality section, for example, and then kind of go into detail. Um, and I think Tim talked about this briefly earlier, but one of the kind of themes in SQL is this idea of substantial evidence. And this uh, goes back to what I said a moment ago. Substantial evidence includes fact, reasonable assumption predicated upon fact, or expert opinion supported by fact. I, you have to have like real evidence the agency has in order to back up its conclusions. Um, as opposed to substantial evidence is not argument, speculation, unsubstantiated opinion or narrative, 
evidence that is clearly inaccurate or erroneous, um, et cetera. And so that's kind of like the guiding um, legal definition of how you have to prove your points in, a, in an EIR, but also as a citizen challenging some of the ideas that might be in an EIR. <clears throat> and this was also discussed a little bit earlier, so I'll be really quick on this. Um, but the basic takeaway here is, as I mentioned earlier, the bar um, to whether or not an EIR is required is actually fairly low. There just has to be some evidence that there may be a significant impact. Um, and again, you know, the killing or um, uh, take of one endangered species could be considered as a significant impact. Um, and so, you know, if you can show that through commenting or through studies or expert testimony, then that requires preparation of an EIR. And um, quite importantly, recent case law has confirmed that in order to establish that an impact is significant, you don't necessarily need expert testimony or expert analysis or studies. Um, even first-hand personal experience of a lay person um, can qualify as evidence of significant impact. For example, you use a commenter saying, hey, this project will cause noise levels to increase dramatically uh, based upon my experience of similar projects in the area or whatnot. Um, that, could, that could be enough to prepare an EIR. Again, it's a fairly low um, standard. But obviously, scientific studies or expert analysis are preferable um, if you can um, you know, leverage that. Um, so now I'm going to go into a little more detail about um, the idea I mentioned earlier, issue spotting, um, spotting potential problems with the analysis in a CEQA document, and then how you can comment on them. So the first thing you want to look at, and this was touched on a little bit earlier, is the project description. Um, I have a quote there from kind of a classic uh, CEQA appellate opinion. An EIR is, or excuse me, an accurate, stable, and finite project description is seen qua non of an informative and legally sufficient EIR. And um, the reason this is important, defining the project description, it defines the scope of the analysis in the EIR and the scope of the impacts. Um, if they define the project as something smaller than what's actually going to happen on the ground, then the lead agency can ignore the impacts of that broader project. And unfortunately, we see that fairly often. Um, which is why zeroing in on the project description can be so important. And um, so on this next slide, and again, these slides will be available to you if you'd like, um, this is just kind of a collection of questions that I ask myself when I'm commenting on a CEQA um, document, specifically on the project description section. Um, are there any inconsistencies between the project description? Is there a mismatch between the EIR's project description and the project as described in other portions of the EIR, or even in the development agreement. Um, and then in larger projects, um, you know, which we often have where there's like different phases, where they're gonna build like you know, X number of houses or whatnot, and then later build more, like how is that taken care of or described in the EIR? Um, does the EIR um, have like contingency plans or proposals if you know one section of the project is built, but future ones are not built? and how is that taken care of or um, described. So that's something to look at and kind of zero in on. Um, let's see. So project description and this idea of piecemealing are kind of two sides of the same coin. And this is um, just kind of relates to what I was just saying. But under CEQA, one of the main issues we see is this idea of piecemealing or segmentation, where um, the EIR only analyzes part of the project instead of the entire project in order to avoid analysis and mitigation of impacts. So the California Supreme Court uh, put together this test um, way back in 1988 in order for um, the public and decision makers to consider what is the scope of the project. And um, so I'm just going to read this out because it's actually it's pretty important. So it said that an EIR must include an analysis of the environmental effects of future expansion or other action if it is a reasonably foreseeable consequence of the initial project and the future expansion or action will be significant and that it will change the scope or nature of the initial project. So how does that play out on the ground? Well, one of the, the main ways this can play out is, does the project include analysis of infrastructure that is related to the project? For instance, if you have like a mining proposal or a housing development or whatnot, it could also require like water infrastructure, it would require new roads, 
highways, interchanges. Sometimes that is analyzed, sometimes it's not. And it's up to citizens and conservation groups to make sure that lead agencies are actually doing their job here. Um, so yeah, here's just, again, some questions that when I'm commenting on EIRs, I ask myself, um, first one, you know, does the EIR divide into two, two pieces and just say they're going to analyze the first piece? In that case, um, you have a fairly, fairly good evidence of piecemealing and you want to call that out. Um, again, does it, does it just analyze, does it fail to analyze the infrastructure? And then kind of a sneaky way that sometimes happens is the infrastructure isn't even included in the project description. Instead, it's characterized as mitigation to reduce project impacts. For example, um, the housing development could have severe traffic impacts. And then way in the mitigation section, they say, well, we're going to expand this two-lane road to a four- or six-lane road in order to deal with the traffic impacts and reduce them. But obviously, making a two-lane road into a six-lane road can have severe imp other impacts, and those aren't necessarily analyzed. So kind of keeping a close eye on that, raising those issues and comments. And then related to that, uh, you know, sometimes a project will prove new zoning but fail to um, analyze impacts of building being built consistent with that zoning. Um, and that's another potential example of piecemealing. Um, so yeah, I think that's all for piecemealing I wanted to touch base on. Um, and now kind of another major CEQA topic to keep an eye out for EIRs is the idea of baseline. And this has been alluded to a couple times. Baseline is just a fancy way of saying environmental conditions um, on the ground right now. Um, so an EIR obviously must evaluate the potential environmental impacts as compared to existing environmental con conditions. And um, as far as when it's supposed to occur, there's this uh, the notice of preparation, which is one of the first steps of the CEQA process. That generally establishes like the baseline year. And so the lead agency, at least in theory, is supposed to um, consider the conditions on the ground during that baseline year. So again, here are some of the questions I ask myself when I am commenting on CEQA projects. Um, and this first one is kind of an interesting issue. Does the EIR compare the project to existing conditions or hypothetical conditions? Um, a, a neat little trick that agencies will play sometimes, which is illegal, but they do it anyway, is they won't compare the project to existing conditions on the ground. They'll say, well, the existing zoning here, or the existing, like Van Vue says, we can do this. And so that's the existing conditions. And they tend to conflate what is you know, allowed under maybe the, the land use plan with what's actually on the ground there, which may just be like wild open space. So um, challenge the agency on that. Um, the EIR, EIR needs to disclose the actual physical conditions, not um, some speculative or hypothetical thing that might occur sometime in the future. And then um, baseline, another big baseline issue, uh, especially for like wildlife issues, is surveys. Um, when you have endangered or threatened species specifically, you're supposed to be conducting um, scientifically defensible surveys for those species in order to ascertain whether they are there, with the physical conditions on the ground. And obviously, um, sometimes consultants will do a really, really poor job of this, depending upon the consulting firm. Um, we've talked a little bit about that, but pushing the agency to actually um, conduct scientifically defensible surveys is very important. Um, for some types of species, there are um, very specific survey procedures recommended by the like, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, those you can probably find online just by Googling the name of the species and protocol survey, and you might be able to find that, and then you can send that to the agency and say, did you do the survey consistent with these protocols? Um, it can be kind of challenging and time consuming, though, because often these surveys can be buried in appendices, uh, very long you know, draft EIR documents. So, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, but again, you don't need to be a lawyer in order to be able to do this type of advocacy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about another um, commenting area, general projects and impacts. Um, I talked a little bit about this during my last talk, but the um, basic idea is under CEQA, you're supposed to analyze project impacts. You're not supposed to just say, oh, those impacts are going to be significant or not significant. End of story. You're supposed to describe them um, in detail, um, and if you don't, then uh, that's a sequel violation. And the other really important thing to watch for is agencies will often say, 
hey, we're going to require a study later about this impact. We're going to study it later, and that's going to be our mitigation. So that's the legal under CEQA 99% um, of the time. So if you see an EIR that says we're going to study this later, then challenge them on that. You can, you know, you, I'll, you'll have these slides, and you can just copy and paste from the case I have cited there that um, condemns that practice. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that when you're commenting and looking at these documents. Um, here, again, just some questions I asked myself. Um, does the EIR contain an accurate description of the project's impacts for each topic area, you know, air quality, biological resources, every special status species that may be present on, present on the site, traffic, water supplies, water quality, et cetera? And then does the EIR simply briefly describe the impact as significant, or does it actually explain why it's significant? And then I alluded to this earlier, does the EIR base its discussion on actual um, analysis studies or evidence, or just conclusory, we have kind of conclusory statements? And again, does the EIR rely on post-approval studies or analysis, or actually study the issue before project approval? Because obviously, the idea with CEQA is that you have the informed decision making um, with all the evidence and record beforehand, as opposed to um, after a project is approved, having studies study the environmental impacts, which at that point doesn't really do anything for anybody because the project's already approved. Um, another very important area to talk to you uh, comments on is mitigation measures. As we've talked about today, um, the EIR is supposed to discuss mitigation measures and alternatives that would substantially lessen the project's significant environmental impacts. That's, in a sense, the heart of CEQA, and if that was complied with, with a lot of bad projects probably wouldn't get approved. Um, but it's up to us as the you know, conservation and local communities to make sure that that is implemented to the greatest extent possible. Um, and so if, if the public proposes reasonable mitigation measures um, for a project that has significant impacts, then the agency has to either, either adopt those measures or provide evidence why they are infeasible. So challenge the agency in your comments to do that. Say, do we have a better way of doing things for this impact? And, um, challenge them to either adopt your measures or alternatives or show why it's not feasible. Because if they can't show why it's not feasible, then they shouldn't be approved yet. <clears throat> um, so yeah, these are just the questions I ask myself. Are there other feasible or potentially feasible measures that the EIR does not require? Um, does the final EIR explain why these other measures are not feasible? In other words, did you comment on the draft EIR and suggest ways to make the project less impactful. And what did they do with those comments? Did they say, oh, we just don't want to do this? Or did they provide some like, economic justification or some, some reason to reject them that was actually based in evidence? And then this is also kind of a, a very common um, pitfall. Um, often with these mitigation measures, they'll include very kind of wishy-washy language that um, makes them essentially unenforceable. They'll say things like, um, the developer or the city will recommend, or the developer will commit, or promise, or seek to, um, and none of that really means anything, because after the project's approved, um, the developer's gonna say, well, it just says we have to be encouraged to do this, and we decided not to do it because it's not feasible or whatnot. So, yeah, challenge the agency to make sure these mitigation measures are actually enforceable, and make sure the text is, is designed in a way that they are enforceable, because under CEQA, um, you're entitled to that. CEQ was very clear that mitigation measures are supposed to be actually binding and enforceable. Um, and this type of wishy-washy language um, should not be in there. And um, the last thing on there, um, challenge the agency with the comment letter to ask who's going to oversee implementation of this mitigation measure. Is it going to be the, the planning director? Is it going to be um, you know, some of the planning staff from the Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife? Because again, what we've seen in, uh, in our work is that Sometimes mitigation measures will be in the EIR, but then will never be implemented or enforced because nobody is, is making sure of that. Um, so again, making sure that the EIR spells it out, the mitigation is spelled out, who's going to be enforcing it and how, um, is something you can raise in your comment letters. <clears throat> okay, um, another mitigation issue. Okay, let's check the time. Um, deferral of developing mitigation measures. This is also a very common tactic of agencies and developers 
developers and their attorneys and consultants, of which they have many, at least the well-funded ones, um, are looking for ways to um, make the mitigation measure look kind of good on paper, but um, make it so they have to do the absolute bare minimum when the project is approved. At least that is my, that is my experience. Um, and so one way they'll do this is say, well, we're going to develop the mitigation measure after the project is approved, but we promise we're going to make sure the impacts are less than significant. And um, CEQA generally prohibits this. And again, it's up to us as you know, the public to um, challenge the, the agency to comply with the law. Um, so in general, like I have right there from the CEQA guideline, it says CEQA does, generally does not allow for the deferral of mitigation measures. And then there's like this four-part test that um, the guidelines have for the only instance where deferral is allowed. And as you can see there, there's quite a few things you have to show if you're going to put off developing mitigation measures. Practical consideration of prevented formulation of the measures, agency committed to developing them, there are specific performance criteria, the EIR lists the mitigation measures to be considered, analyzed, and possibly incorporated into the mitigation plan. So that's a lot of work. Um, and what agencies will do though is say, oh, we are going to, we're going to figure this out later, we're going to, we promise we're going to mitigate this, we just haven't figured out how. But unless they're doing all four of those steps, they are violating CEQA. And so again, you can raise that issue in your comment letters. Um, and I'm just going to grab some water. But yeah, this is just, again, questions I ask myself um, when looking at mitigation measures that I'm concerned about. So yeah, look for those deferred mitigation measures. Then ask if they, if they complied with all those things, and if they didn't, challenge them to um, adopt mitigation measures prior to project approval, like you're supposed to do in CEQA anyway. So I'm going to do a, a slightly deeper dive on air quality and public health, just because um, it's an issue that comes up in a lot of these projects, at least that I've worked on. And there's also some fairly good new case law from the California Supreme Court um, that is something that you can cite that some of these agencies either might not be aware of, or if they are aware of, are hoping to ignore as long as possible. Um, so the Sierra Club v. County of Fresno case from December 2018, the California Supreme Court Regulations of laws and policies, and the actual analysis sections are actually fairly short. So unless you want to read in depth on all these policies that may or may not be applicable to the project, try to focus on the actual sections of the ENR that are about the project, which again can kind of be sifting through um, a lot of nonsense and boilerplate. Um, I think that was all for that one. Common deadlines. Yeah, this obviously, I'm sure some of you have come up against and been frustrated with, I have for sure. Um, you know, a lead agency will be working with a consulting firm and developer for like five years on a draft EIR, and then give the public like 45 days to look at this multi-thousand page document. Um, I, I don't see how that supports public participation, but that's the process, unfortunately, they sometimes use. Um, once you get one of these secret documents, if you don't think you're going to have time to look at the whole thing or don't have colleagues, you can um, immediately ask for an extension. You know, obviously point to the length of the document and say that in order to have public participation, it, um, we need like an extension of say like 60 to 90 additional days. Um, and sometimes agencies will grant that, especially with larger or controversial projects. That'll at least give you more time to work with your you know, colleagues, allies, community members to um, put together um, comments. But you know, for draft EIRs, even if you miss the comment deadline, um, that doesn't mean you can't submit comments. It just means that the agency doesn't have a legal um, responsibility to um, respond to them in the final EIR. So you know, even if you find out a project like a year after the draft EIR has been done, the comment deadline is expired, you can still submit detailed comments. 
Um, and the agency can ignore them at their own peril, basically. Um, so, yeah, definitely submit comments early and often. Um, definitely early. Um, and obviously, you can comment any time up to and until project approval, but anything after project approval doesn't really matter to the agency because they've already made the decision. And of course, not going to listen to it either. Um, let's see. And yeah, this is just um, some not really legal advice, but um, ways to amplify your comments. And this may again be speaking to the choir in a sense. Um, reach out to local news, contact reporters who have covered the project or similar projects. Make sure if it's like something that's going to affect your community that the press knows about it. Um, decision makers are sometimes more likely to respond if there's public awareness or scrutiny. Um, and um, as some of the other presenters mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, try to meet with decision makers, uh, explain your concerns early uh, before too much time has passed and the developer has already spent um, a bunch of money on the EIR and doesn't want to change anything. And then meet with planning staff because often they need to be educated um, on these issues and sometimes um, are just taking cues from the consultants. Um, and yeah, so I talked about this a little bit during the last se session, but um, send litigation hold language to the um, lead agency in one of your comment letters, and I'll have a sample of that on one of these slides, but basically make sure they know that they need to not destroy any records related to the project. Um, this administrative record includes all project-related communications. Um, which often will include consultant files as well, at least in some circumstances. So making sure the agency is aware of that um, and doesn't continue to destroy files as some of these agencies do is really important. Yeah, here's just some language. It's, it's very <laughs> verbose and wordy, but the, the, the idea is to trigger their, their obligation under state law to preserve all records and not suspend, and, and to suspend any data destruction policies. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'm going to subject you to reading all of that out loud. Um, but yeah, basically it says preserve all the records and text messages and blah, 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 including consultant files. And if you don't, then that's not good. So, um, And then this is just some other kind of thoughts. Some of them are commenting suggestions. Some are just experiences with the SQL process. Um, what I've noticed is, especially with controversial projects, um, in like the week or two before project approval, they'll send out the final EIR, and they'll include hundreds and hundreds of pages of new documents, new studies, statement of overriding considerations, mitigation monitoring and reporting program, all sorts of things that give you virtually no time to look at them or comment on them, which can be very frustrating, but um, you still kind of do the best you can, and one thing you can also do is demand that the EIR be recirculated due to significant new information. Um, agencies will almost always say, oh, there's never any new significant information, even though we've produced you know, thousands of new studies and whatnot on the EBA project approval. But you can still argue that the EIR should be recirculated for more public comment. And obviously, do the best you can to um, review all those documents, because often we'll change things last minute and leave very little time for public comment. Um, and um, let's see what else is on here. Yeah, I think that's just the takeaway with that. Again, it can be frustrating, but um, do the best you can when they do the last minute dump of studies and analysis right before project approval. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but when a EIR is certified, after that you only have 30 days to bring a challenge. Um, if you are considering challenging a project, um, start figuring out if you're going to have a legal counsel well before project approval, because if you wait until when the project is approved, um, you're, you're facing a very tight time frame at that point. Um, and then obviously look into retaining appropriate counsel well before the project is approved, um, ideally just so they can um, comment on the project as well. Um, attorney comments are often similar to um, layperson comments, but um, sometimes they can spot issues that are a little harder to spot. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say on that. I already talked about how they're accrued over the holidays. Um, 
exhaustion administrative remedies. We talked a little bit about that, which is why it's so important to comment in the first place. Also, and I think this will be touched on in Tim's presentation later this afternoon, but make sure um, if there's an appeal procedure that you take advantage of it. Sometimes the appeal procedures will not be clear or are well publicized. Um, but the problem is if you don't do the mandatory appeal um, after they've made their final decision, the court might just throw out your lawsuit for saying, oh, you didn't comply with the agency's appeal procedures, therefore I'm not going to hear your case. So you obviously want to be really careful that if there is some kind of appeal to the board or whatnot, that you go through that process, even if you think it's futile, even if you know that they're just going to rubber stamp the project they already approved. Um, and then the last thing I have on here is consider submitting a California Public Records Act request for documents relating to the project. Um, you can do that as soon as the project kind of comes onto your radar, and then submit like a follow-up request later on once more documents are produced. But um, if you actually get documents before the project is approved, it can be kind of a fertile ground for additional comments. Because sometimes there'll be stuff in there um, showing that the consultants initially maybe agreed with your position, but after pressure from the developer, they you know went the other way or whatnot. And that type of stuff is, is good to kind of put before the decision makers as early as possible, because often they don't even kind of get that, that deep into the weeds. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, good luck on commenting. <laughs>